Christmas. <laughs> Man, there's no way that I would rather spend Christmas Eve than right here with you, Foothills. I want to say Merry Christmas to those joining us online. And can we say Merry Christmas to our Pendleton campus that's joining us today? So good to be here. If you're here at one of our physical locations, you got to walk in uh, to Whoville as well because we've been theming our Christmas series around the Christmas movie, The Grinch. We've been trying to just capture some of the wonder and the awe and the magical feelings that come with Christmas. I mean, there's so many wonderful pieces to Christmas, whether it's the bright lights or the food or the parties or the games and the movies and the nostalgic music. It's just a magical time. But what we've been doing with the Grinch is we've been looking at similarities to Whoville uh, that we have with us and, and who we are. And so in, in Whoville, Christmas is a huge to-do. And the Grinch, who steals Christmas, makes the mistake of assuming that Christmas is really all about presents. And who could blame him? I mean, there's this scene in the movie where it's leading up to Christmas and everybody is going crazy to get gifts. If, if you've seen the one with Jim Carrey, they're in a store, there's crazy lines. And I remember somebody at the cash register, I think, I don't remember the exact phrase, I think he says, for the next 10 minutes, everything's 99% off. And everyone's like, ah, <laughs> you know, going nuts and receipts are flying and everything's getting wrapped and put into post office boxes. And so the Grinch, he assumes, he assumes that, Christmas is about presents, and, and, and can't we kind of look at Christmas in a similar way? I mean, many of us, we've been building up towards tomorrow with anticipation to make sure that gifts are ready, that they're all wrapped, that, that everybody is accounted for, that when we wake up tomorrow, everyone's excited and has a gift to give and a gift to receive, and, and there's some good in that. I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's an exciting thing that we're able to share uh, joy and love through generosity. And before, before we move on to the message, I want to just celebrate a way that Foothills, you have shared joy and love through generosity this Christmas season. Over the last month, we've been taking up a Christmas offering above our, our regular giving. And it's a way that we're able to provide Christmas for kids here in the upstate that might not otherwise uh, receive gifts on Christmas morning. And we are also able to put a lot of energy into local partners. And Foothills, I just want you to know that so far in the month of December, you have, you have given $80,000 to that Christmas offering. That is awesome. That is awesome. Hundreds of families, hundreds of kids that are gonna wake up tomorrow being impacted because of your generosity. And there's other organizations that are meeting needs right here in the community and you're making a difference. But you also have presents to get for your loved ones. And I've started to learn that giving gifts, the, the difficulty level of giving a gift is tied to the age of the person you're giving the gift to. Would you agree with that? Like the younger a person, the easier it is to give them a gift. If you've got a toddler, that's a pretty easy gift to give. You're going to be able to blow a toddler's mind pretty easily with a present. It doesn't really cost a lot. It's just got to capture their attention and it's got to be something that they can play with. Once, once you've got a teenager, it gets a little bit different. Because with a teenager, they're looking at what their friends got from their parents. And so they're comparing and contrasting. And then for adults, it gets even more difficult to make sure that you get the right gift. And it gets especially difficult when you've got to get gifts for those same adults again and again every year. Like, how do you top what you did last year? You better not go too big this year, because if you go so big, how are you going to top that next year? My dad has figured out how to be the perfect gift giver for my mom. Here's what he does. He says, okay, why don't you just go buy what you want, wrap it, put it under the tree, and uh, you know, label that it's from me. And the way that I knew that this is how my dad did it is because every year when my mom's opening a gift, my dad's just got the look on his face like, well, let's see what I got you this year, babe. <laughs> my favorite part was always when she would open it and uh, his eyes would kind of get big and then he'd start kind of looking around for receipts or tags to figure out how much money he spent. It's like, sorry, dad, uh, that's, that's what you get. But I figured out that really the best gifts meet one of two questions. They meet the question, what do you need? 
Like, is there something that you need that you don't have? Even if you don't realize you need it, when you get a gift and it meets a need, there's something special about that gift. That's a good gift. Or what do you want? If there's something that you want that you don't have or you can't have, if you have a gift that meets a desire, that tends to be a good gift as well. I've got two of my favorite gifts that I've, I've ever received that meet some of these categories here with me. So my grandmother has figured out the need category uh, when giving me a gift. Pretty much every year, I think, honestly, I think since I was a teenager, for every year, I can expect this gift from my grandma. And I'm looking forward to it, grandma, uh, when I come in town next week. She has met the need by giving me a gift, a package of new socks every year. It's a good gift. I, I literally, I don't think I've bought a pack of socks in like 15 years. I haven't needed to. And right now, the socks in my drawer are starting to wear holes in them. It's like... It's perfect timing. Grandma, I can't, I can't wait. I'm going to be there. And so speaking of which, I don't need this pair of socks. Anybody need a last minute Christmas gift? <laughs> Pastor Drew, you find somebody? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, Pendleton. We didn't forget about you guys. Pastor Joseph, you got that pair of socks? Go ahead, hook somebody up over there. Can we clap for them over there? <laughs> So that's a, that's a gift that met a need. Uh, another gift, this was a gift from my wife that met a desire. And this was a meaningful gift. One year when she got me tickets to a college football game. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was a meaningful gift. I mean, I shed a tear that year. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and I, it was meaningful that I was going to be going to the game. And, you know, that, that's a good reason to shed a tear, but that's not why I shed a tear. You know why I shed a tear? because I had thought I had figured out how to give a good gift. And so my wife was about to open her gift that I got her, which was a pack of new socks. <laughs> so uh, my wife now shops for her own gifts. She's got them wrapped and put under the tree and I'll find out what I'm giving her tomorrow as well. Just trying to make you proud, Dad, so. <laughs> no, a good gift. It, it meets a need or it meets a desire. The best kind of gift is one that meets both. Something that you need and something that you want. And see, the Grinch, he, he was mistaken. He thought that you could get these types of gifts to make Christmas the most meaningful event by going to a store. That's why there's this famous line towards the end of the movie where the Grinch says, perhaps Christmas doesn't come from a store, right? And we know that. We know that the true meaning of Christmas is about a gift that doesn't come from a store. It is a gift uh, that truly meets a great need in our world and a great desire that our world had. And it's the gift of God's son, Jesus. And that's what Christmas is all about. And that's what we come together to celebrate in the Christmas season is the most important gift that this world has ever received. And there's many reasons that, that God gave this gift. I want to throw some of them on the screen for us. Many reasons that Jesus came. He came to be with us. The prophet Isaiah said, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And did you know that that statement that God will be with us it's listed in 140 verses in the Bible. So when Jesus arrived here on earth, it was the ultimate fulfillment of that promise from God. Jesus also came to show us what God is like. Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. And Jesus actually said that if anyone has seen him, they've seen the Father in heaven. There are many people who don't like God, and that's because they've created an image of God in their mind, maybe based on the way that humans have misrepresented him, or maybe based on the way that religious institutions have misrepresented him. And I would encourage you, if, if you struggle with liking God, maybe give Jesus a shot, because Jesus actually said that he came to 
to be the visible image of the invisible God. And so in this book, the Bible, there's, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the story of the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And as you get to know Jesus, that's the best way for you to figure out who God is. Jesus came to show us what God is like. He also came to show us an example of what life can really be like. John 10, 10, Jesus said that he came so that we could have life and we could have it to the full. And Jesus lived life to the full. I mean, he experienced the temptations, the struggles, the grief, the suffering, the pain that you and I will experience. But in the midst of that, he lived filled with joy. He lived filled with peace. He lived filled with kindness. He showed us how to live a life that was full of grace for people, but full of unwavering truth. Jesus showed us what life to the full looks like, how God intended for us to be able to live. And he also came to show us that God is faithful, to show us that God is faithful. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, for all God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. God made good on his promise to save the world when Jesus arrived. When Jesus arrived here in this world, the light that Jesus promised, the hope that Jesus promised arrived. And, and the truth of what was promised from prophecies for generations and generations, it was cemented when Jesus died and then rose again. And so Jesus came to make good on all of the promises that God gave. And so those are a lot of great, incredible reasons that God sent this gift in Jesus. But I think the most incredible thing, the most incredible thing about this gift that God gave is that God sent this gift in Jesus for you. I think that's the most incredible truth that we could take away is that God did all of this, this gift that he gave. It was for you. That Jesus came and he gave of his life for you. He gave of his life for me. God gave this gift for us. And what I wanna do today is I wanna look at what makes this gift that God gave the most incredible gift in the world. A gift that meets needs that you have and desires that you have, needs that are in your life and wants that are in your life. And I wanna do this by looking at the most famous words Jesus spoke. It's the most famous verse in the entire Bible. A verse that most of us in this room will know, even if, even if you're new to church today, you've probably heard this verse. It's John 3.16. Jesus said this. He was in a conversation that he was having with a religious leader where he was describing what it means to trust in him for forgiveness of sins and to be saved and to be born again and how we can be reconciled to God. It's in the book of John. It's in chapter three. It's this awesome conversation. But John 3.16, it kind of sums up the whole gift and the meaning of, of Christmas. It says this, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I wanna look at two ways today on this Christmas Eve, two ways that the gift of Jesus is what we all need and what we all want. The first is this, Jesus gives everyone, and that, that word everyone is key, Jesus gives everyone a place to belong. Jesus gives everyone, let me clarify, everyone who believes a place to belong. Jesus gives everyone who believes a place to belong. See, the religious leaders that were present at the time of Jesus' birth, they were anticipating the savior of the world to come. But they had kind of created an image in their mind for what would arrive, like for how God would come and save them. And so they had pictured this probably military leader or warrior 
one that would come to people of status or people who, who were clean enough or religious enough. And, and when Jesus came, he already defied odds by who he was willing to allow to be welcomed in his birth story. Like we can just look at his birth story and see how inclusive Jesus was to everyone. I mean, first, he, he reaches out and gives an opportunity to these poor teenagers in Mary and Joseph that are from insignificant places. They're insignificant people and they play a significant role in the life of Jesus, in the birth of Jesus, in raising Jesus. And then after his birth, the Lord invites wise men who are from a foreign place to be able to come in and bring their gifts. And these wise men are welcome. And Jesus is making it clear out of the gate that even those from a foreign place are welcome to be there with Jesus. And then when the angels appear to the shepherds, the shepherds, man, the shepherds was like, this was kind of the dirty job of the time. This was, this was kind of the rough around the edges group. These guys were typically working a third shift. These were the guys, they would, they would sleep where the sheep sleep, they would eat when the sheep eat or probably eat what they eat at times. I mean, these guys, like they had a stench about them. They smelled like sheep and religious leaders did not want to be around shepherds if shepherds hadn't cleaned up. There was, there was a distance that took place and that was who the angel appeared to, to come and be able to celebrate and see Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was making it clear from the very start that he was here for everyone. And that pattern continued into his adult ministry. I mean, Jesus reached out to people and it was surprising the type of people that he reached out to. Jesus was willing to build relationships with people from foreign rival cities. Jesus was willing uh, to, to give dignity to children that were often overlooked. Jesus gave status and dignity to women. Jesus treated the poor just the same as he did the rich. He showed no favoritism. With Jesus, everyone who was willing to believe in him, they were welcome in his life and in his circle. They were welcome at the table with him. Jesus was ridiculed for the type of people that he was willing to be around. But it's good news for all of us because what Jesus is letting us know is when that word in John 3, 16 says that everyone for God so loved the world, look at this. This is how God loved the world, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That word everyone, it means everyone. Why don't you say it, everyone. everyone. Let's say it a little louder, everyone. everyone. That's good, that's right. God means everyone. Jesus came for everyone. Here's a picture of the everyone that is gonna be there worshiping Jesus when he returns again. Look at Revelation 7, verse nine. It says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the lamb, there with Jesus. This vast picture of how big God's love is. Like when it says that, that God loved the world, God is showing that he means all of the people in the world from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. Like God's love is so good because of how big his love is. But that's not the only thing that makes his love for the world so good. Actually, I think that what makes his love so good is is not just how big the world is, but actually how bad the world is. Part of what makes God's love so amazing is not just how big the world is, but how bad the world is. See, it says that, that he so loved the world. Let's go back to the verse again. Can we throw up John 3.16 again? I know it's out of order, but I just kinda wanna keep coming back to this. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. What Jesus offers, what Jesus offers, the second thing 
that we need and want. He meets the need that the bad that we've caused in the world is resulting in. What he does, number two, Jesus gives everyone who believes a way to be forgiven. Jesus gives everyone who believes a way to be forgiven. I think for us to understand the power of of what this verse is saying, that God has offered us a gift in Jesus that will keep us from experiencing death and instead inheriting eternal life, I think we have to fully understand um, what sin is and, and how sin results in death. See, sin is, is when we go against God. Sin is when you and I know what's right and we turn away. And, and God is who determines what's right. But when we turn away from God, that is sin, okay? So when we are walking in the opposite direction of God, that is sin. Now, God, he is the author of life. He is the one who created life. He is the one who gives life. So when we walk away from life, we are walking towards death. It is a natural consequence. In fact, in Romans, it says that the wages of sin, like the cost of sin, it's death. It's, it's death, and it's, it's a natural consequence. And, and we, could, we could look at this not just in, in the end of our life and the fact that we are going to die because of sin, but we could look at the deaths that sin cause us in our life, in relationships that we have. Because sin, it creates a gap between us and God, but it also creates a gap between us and people. Sin introduces seeds of death into relationships. When you sin against your spouse, you introduce seeds of death into that relationship. When you sin against a friend, you introduce seeds of death into that friendship. When, when you sin against a parent or against a child, you introduce seeds of death into that relationship. I, I mean, think about it, I, I wrote down just some more here. When, when you steal, you put security in a relationship to death. When you cheat, you put commitment in a relationship to death. When, when you choose laziness, you put responsibility uh, to death. When you neglect, you put whatever or whoever you were in charge of nurturing to death. Th- these are just like natural consequences for when you choose wrong. Like sin, it just introduces seeds of death. The reason that we have death in our world is because of sin. It's because humans have turned away from God. We turned away from the author of life. And so the natural consequence for that is death. And so in order for there to be a reconciliation where there's death, there there must be forgiveness. And so God made a way for you and I to receive that forgiveness. And that is why Jesus came. And, and the good news is that he loved the world enough to send it for everyone because we all need that payment and that forgiveness because we're all guilty of sin. There is no one, there is no one who is without sin. There is no one who is without fault. It says this in Romans, for everyone, there's that word, everyone, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But going back to the other verse that we read a moment ago in Romans, where it says that the wages of sin is death, look at the rest of this verse. It says, but the free gift, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus offers the gift to pardon our sins so that we can receive the forgiveness of God. He makes us right with God. He allows there to be reconciliation in our relationship with God where we can turn back and even though we've done bad and even though we don't deserve a relationship with God, even though we chose death to that relationship because of our sin, 
Because of Jesus' love for us, he came down and he took the punishment of that sin. He took death when he didn't deserve it. He wore darkness when he didn't deserve it. He humbled himself and experienced the things that we experience as humans, the pain and the suffering, even though he didn't deserve it. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to offer you his forgiveness. And it's a free gift that if we receive, we can be made right with God. That's why his followers in Acts, when they went around telling the world about what Jesus had done, this is how they described it in Acts 13. He said, brothers, listen, we're here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. And by being made right in God's sight, we reintroduce life where death has happened and what John 3.16, that verse that we're anchored in says, is that we will now receive eternal life where we should have received eternal death apart from God forever. Instead, after the natural consequence of our sin here on earth, after we die, if we place our faith in Jesus, we can receive eternal life and be reunited with Jesus and everyone else who believes in him forever. I wanna read John 3.16 again. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I wanna ask you a question. Do you know that you have eternal life today? Yes. Do you know? Do you have security in knowing that you have received that free gift? that Jesus offered by coming here? His birth story is amazing, but the purpose of his birth story was so that he could come and accomplish what he did through his death, burial, and resurrection. Have you placed your faith in Jesus to receive that gift that he has given? And if you have, maybe today it's to stop and be reminded of how amazing it is to know that despite your sins, past, present, and future, God loved you enough to give you this gift of Jesus, to come here and take the punishment for your sin so that you could have a place to belong for eternity and a way to be forgiven forever. It is absolutely beautiful, this gospel story what Jesus accomplished for you and me. At, at the end of the movie in The Grinch, the Grinch is, he's got all the presents on the sleigh and him and Max are somewhere up on Mount Crumpet. And he's getting ready, I think, to like throw all the presents off the edge of, of Mount Crumpet and just be done with this. He's, he's stolen Christmas, it's, it's accomplished. And, there's a, this kind of sudden moment where he hears the who's down in Whoville and, and they're like all singing and they're holding hands and he's like, he's shocked, right? He, he can't believe it. He, he thought he stole Christmas and he, and he didn't. They're still there. They're still celebrating Christmas and he leans in and, and, and tends to listen. And this is, this is the moment in the movie where he does say, per, perhaps Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas means a little bit. Let's try it again. Maybe Christmas means a little bit. And that's when his heart starts growing, right? And the Grinch thought maybe he could save Christmas if he gets all the gifts back, but he didn't have to save Christmas. Christmas was already good. What he got to do was he got to receive Christmas for the first time all over again as he came down and what he was longing for as he heard them singing, as he heard this moment, what he was longing for, he was longing to belong just like they were belonging with a group of people. He was alone and he was longing to have a group like that that he could belong in. And while he's up there on Mount Crumpet, he's wondering, will they even accept me? Because I've hurt them. 
Will they forgive me? He was longing for a way to be forgiven. It's why he's trying to get these presents back and get them back to him because he's longing for these two things. They were two things that he needed and they're two things that he wanted. And it's why if you've seen this movie at this scene, you're so moved by this is because deep down you long for a place to belong. We all do. We all long for a place, a group, a people, a place of meaning where we can belong. And we all long to be forgiven because we all know that we've done bad. We all know that if we all showed our rap sheets, we'd all find out stuff about each other that would blow each other's minds. It would just be like, oh my goodness. We all have sinned and we all long for this desire to be forgiven. We, we long to belong to a group of people who would know our worst mistakes and still love us anyways because they choose to forgive us. And the good news of the gospel and of Jesus is that he offers us that. But if you're like me, you tried to find places to belong elsewhere, all throughout the world, because you had that longing and you tried to find ways to have that feeling of forgiveness met through other people or through other circumstances in your life. And so you went searching and you went searching and you went searching. And through that journey, Jesus was just patient with you and he was patient with you and he was patient with you while he was waiting for you to realize that he was the only place that could meet the deepest need and desire in your heart where you would belong forever and be forgiven fully for everything you've ever done. He's done that for me, and I, I kind of want to share a little bit about what, what he's done with that for me by a little kind of illustration. Um, a sip of water here. So, last year um, in January, my wife turned 30, and uh, I'm not the best gift giver, uh, or, or, you know, <laughs> I struggle with like making sure I celebrate these big days, but I knew the 3-0, I gotta get this one right. So with the help of some really great friends that, that love Katie really well, I was able to pull off not one, but two surprise parties, it was epic. We did one here in Seneca, and then we went back up in Tennessee the next week and surprised her there with people that we hadn't seen since we had moved three years prior that, that showed up. I mean, she was, she was blown away. It was, it was like, it was awesome. I, I, I was like, yes, I pulled it off. And, um, but at, at any type of party where you're there to celebrate like a guest of honor, it's someone's birthday, there, there's typically this moment where Somebody will get up to give a toast, right? Like you kind of get up to, to get everyone's attention and acknowledge, you know, why we're, why we're all there. And, and so I remember like when I got up in, in Tennessee specifically, I'm looking out among all, all of these people and I, I was just blown away thinking, my goodness, I mean, these people, like we haven't been in their life for three years um, we're not moving back. We love South Carolina. We're here for good. So, I mean, why are they, uh, why are they, why are they willing to show up? And, and I just couldn't help but think, of course they're willing. Really, Katie's the easiest person in the world to celebrate. Like this is, if you know my Katie, man, the reason they were there is because the way she had been there for them. And so they were there. And so it was just this easy moment to just, to just celebrate Katie, share some kind words and as I was thinking back to that, to that party, I was thinking about Christmas Eve. And I was thinking about how Christmas is us celebrating Jesus' birthday. And, and really, um, that's, why, that's why the majority of us are here today. And some of us are here on a regular basis. We're actively hanging out with Jesus. But some of you, you've been distant with Jesus, and that's okay. Some of you haven't been around Jesus for a while, but there's something about this moment, this celebration of his birthday that you gotta show up because somewhere deep down, you, you know he's done something for you. And so you just gotta be there. 
Like you gotta be there to celebrate this moment and this historic day. And then there may be others of you that are here. You're, you're, you know, you're with family or you're a guest of somebody and that happens at parties too, but you're, you would still hear what, the, what the, uh, the guest of honor means to all of us. And so I just thought, you know, for all the people in this room that believe in Jesus, you could probably get up here and do this, but I'll do this for us right now in a short version. I'm not gonna do a long version, although I could take all day to give a toast to Jesus, but I'll give a short version. And then my encouragement to you with your family over the next few days, as you're celebrating, if you took a moment to stop and you tried to give a toast to Jesus to explain what he means to you and what he's done for you, to soak in and realize what he's truly done to give you a place to belong, what it means to truly be fully forgiven. And so, so here I stand just thinking about you, Jesus. This is your day. And so this is for you, Jesus. You're the one that loved me at my lowest. You believed in me when I was at my worst. And you pursued me even when I was running away. And when I, when I ran to all the wrong places to belong, when I ran to substances as a teenager because I was afraid of getting left out and left behind and left alone, you patiently waited. You patiently waited for me to let that run its course and feel the brokenness and shame that was associated with that. And when I felt that shame, you didn't make me feel shame. You welcomed me right back in. Jesus, that was you that said, I'm still rooting for you. I still love you. I'm still the gift that's offering everything I've got for you. And when I didn't receive it fully in that moment, like when, when, I, when I believed it, but not with like 110% yet. And so I looked to cover that shame by turning to relationships, thinking, you know, maybe I can find a, a perfect friend that fully knows me and fully loves me, that makes me feel like I'm fully forgiven, or I can find the perfect girl or the perfect relationship that can give me that, that feeling of, of feeling whole by being fully loved, like that feeling of forgiveness. And, and so when I ran from relationship to relationship, thinking that was gonna solve it, you patiently waited while I learned that no human is gonna fill that void that was made for you to fill. No human can fully forgive me for all of my sins that are between me and God, except you, Jesus. And you patiently waited. And then when I ran from that to trying to prove myself through achievement and all the other things that I've run to in my life, you kept pursuing me, Jesus. And you loved me. And as I've received you fully, you have given me a place to belong and a way to be forgiven forever. And so today is your birthday, Jesus. So this is for you, my friend, my savior, and my king, Jesus Christ. The gift of the meaning of Christmas, the gift of God's Son, the gift of Jesus is for you. You know, we want to kind of use the phrase that Jesus is the reason for the season. You want to know something? In Jesus' eyes, you are the reason for the season. You are the reason that he came. And so for some of us, man, I pray that we will take some time to remember what he's done for us this Christmas. We celebrate him, and we thank him, that we refresh just that excitement and that passion that we have for him. But for others that are here today, you've not received Jesus, there is no way that we're gonna leave here without giving you an opportunity to receive that free gift of salvation. It's a gift that you can't earn. You, you don't pay for this gift. It's not gonna be by doing enough good deeds or giving enough to the poor or showing up to church enough. It's a free gift, but a gift has to be received. And so we wanna give you that opportunity right now today. Can we pray at all of our campuses? 
every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you are here at any one of the campuses and you wanna give your life to Jesus today, you wanna receive that free gift of salvation that God sent in his son Jesus, I want you to do something bold. I want you to lift your hand up right where you're at so that we can see it. If you wanna receive the gift of Jesus today, I want you to lift your hand right where you're at at all the campuses. Amen. Amen. If that's you, would you just pray a prayer with me like this? Say, Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner and that the consequences of my sin is death. But today I choose to believe that you came here for me, that you died for my sins and that God raised you from the dead. So I ask you to give me the free gift of life, eternal life today. And I will choose to follow you for the rest of my life here on earth. It's in your mighty name that we pray. And God, I pray, I pray for the rest of my brothers and sisters in Christ here. Lord, as we, as we step into the rest of celebrating Christmas together, I pray for moments where we are each able to give you that toast, Jesus, to celebrate this day that we remember your birth. I pray that you will remind us of meaningful moments where you picked us up, where you cleaned us up, where you gave us freedom and confidence, where you gave us peace and joy and hope. Lord, remind us, remind us what you've done and fill us with the joy of that salvation all over again this Christmas. It's in your name we pray.